Brothers and sisters, a tremendous grace to you and continued peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be to each and every one of you, even in these pandemic times, fellow redeemed. <clears throat> so the perils of an unforgiving spirit or the importance of forgiveness. Really? Seriously? Come on, Ron. You can't really be serious, especially in the world in which we're living today. I mean, you got to just look around at these things. Certainly a person is justified, at least somewhat, in withholding forgiveness. I mean, come on, who realistic? I mean, seriously, folks, let's, let's cut out the religious stuff. Who realistically could expect somebody to forgive someone if that person had been treated, and I mean, incredibly bad? And we've seen it. Some of us maybe has even experienced it. All we've got to do is look around. And look at some of the things that have been happening and look through it through the lenses of reality as to whether we ought to forgive or not. I mean, seriously, are we not entitled to seek some justice and some revenge, maybe? I mean, we have our judicial systems. It consists of law and order, as well as the courts and our penal systems. So there realistically exist righteous judgments that are to be rendered where withholding forgiveness and executing those judicial systems is very much right and proper. Correct? I mean, people, let me tell you something. I was an agent in that community and executed those judgments against people. So are we not correct in that? I'm not interested right now in the religious response. Let's just call a spade a spade. You might be very much surprised as to Jesus' answer to that question. Thus our text. Jesus has been teaching the disciples on sin as to their tendencies in continuing to sin. Now these disciples didn't have just one sin. They had a boatload. And they were doing it time after time after time after time. And we saw last week where the disciples continued to want to dispute as to who's the greatest disciple. And now Jesus has to tell them, as well as to us, what should our reactions be should a fellow disciple or a Christian brother or sister in Christ offend you or ticks you off here in the church. It happens quite often. So how are we to react as well as the disciples? Jesus gives to the disciples and us the remedy for those disputes in chapter 18, verses 15 through 20. However, the problem is that people, including Christians and even pastors, don't put this remedy into practice, which is Jesus' prescription for this disease, and it's a disease. As a result, we're left with conflicts and continued hurt feelings. Churches split over stuff like this. Reluctance in putting Jesus' instructions of Matthew 18, 15 through 17 stems, quite frankly, from people's willingness to become outspoken critics of Jesus' instructions. Do you realize that? We set ourselves up as being critics over Jesus' instructions, plain, pure, and simple. Okay? 
We see in our text where Peter once again becomes an outspoken critic of Jesus' instructions. Peter, why? Why does he continue to do this? Open mouth and insert two feet. He does it all the time. Why? Well, consider these. Peter continues to feel very strongly that he is most special over the other disciples. In fact, he even feels very much superior to them and even perhaps even more superior to Jesus. If that can happen. You see, it could be that Peter still hasn't gotten over the Jesus' commendation of him as to his confession of Jesus as the Messiah. So therefore, he just might feel that he's entitled to special treatment and consideration. <clears throat> we also sometimes feel the same way. When we also feel that we deserve special consideration and attention from Jesus. Maybe, perhaps. You see, Peter, I think, really feels that he believes he's the head of the Christian church. For which, according to him, gives him that authority to be a critic and then get away with it. So as a result of being that critic, Peter desires to put a limit on the extension of forgiveness. Peter feels very strongly that forgiving someone seven times for committing the exact same sin or offense is enough for a couple of reasons. First of all, in accordance with his Jewish religion, one only had to forgive a person five times for committing that same sin. After that, one could make the judgment call that the person wasn't sincere enough and thereby justified in withholding forgiveness. You're just playing the game here, buddy. Peter, though, says to Jesus that, hey, Jesus, I'm willing to forgive someone for that same offense up to seven times here, man. Not only satisfactorily satisfying his religious requirements, but tacking on an additional two more occasions. Way to go, Peter. You're a generous guy. Peter was quite impressed with himself, and he also felt that Jesus would be as well. An incredible display of his self-righteous mercy. However, Jesus was not impressed at all. See, Peter firmly believed that there are situations and circumstances where it is warranted and that one is very much justified to withhold forgiveness. Therefore, Peter feels very much confident that he is sincerely right in his analysis, when in reality, he is sincerely and totally wrong. Peter. What does that say about us? Dangerously so. Peter desires to do what many of us desire to do, and that is draw the line in the sand. Step over that line, and you suffer the consequences. As a result, he feels very confident, since he truly feels that he's not only the head disciple, but perhaps even the head of the Christian church. Quite an arrogant position. There's pastors that feel that way too. And priests. So Peter is realizing from Jesus' previous teachings that have been recorded in the prior verses of the text that he is to be the one to take the initiative to forgive his brother or sister disciple that causes him quite a bit of discomfort. So I've got to take the lead in this, huh? Hmm. So does that also cause us that same discomfort? Well, we might have to go to a brother and sister and initiate forgiveness. As a result of that, he willingly desires to put conditions or limits on Jesus' instructions, even though Jesus doesn't. He does. Well, 
I don't really need to forgive because of whatever. Or I can only I'll forgive up to this point, but I'm going to continue to bring it up. And we just put conditions and conditions and conditions and conditions, and Jesus puts none on. Jesus responds to this situation quite profoundly. Jesus refutes Peter's generosity and tells Peter to forgive not just seven times Peter, but 70 times seven. So Peter perhaps probably figured, well, you know, Jesus, that's 490 times. So on that 491st time, bam, man, I can nail the dude. Well, maybe not. <laughs> maybe I'm being too hard on Peter, you know. But quite a different response from Jesus than what Peter might have expected. <clears throat> At least it was quite different than the commendation that he received from Jesus as to his confession as Messiah. That's a fact. Jesus then subsequently tells the disciples this parable about a self-righteous servant and his erroneous view of forgiveness. Within that parable, it tells of a king who shows tremendous mercy to his servant by canceling a huge, huge debt, while the servant refused to do the same thing to another over a very pittance amount. Who cares? Just write it off. Jesus then concludes by saying that if one harbors an unforgiving spirit, brothers and sisters, listen to this, neither will Jesus forgive either. And he doesn't care who you are. You can be the bishop, the head of this church, the president, who cares? If you're not willing to forgive, you don't expect Jesus to forgive you either. Um, brothers and sisters, a Christian is to be merciful as Jesus is merciful, as stated in St. Luke 6.36, with no limitations, no boundaries, or no conditions. Period. A Christian is not to withhold forgiveness nor question a person's sincerity. That is Jesus' job, not yours or mine. The only exception is that Jesus does give to the church the keys to withhold the forgiveness of sins to unrepentant sinners only until such time as the person repents. That is the only exception or condition that Jesus upholds. No other. And it doesn't matter what religion you are. Who cares? You see, my brothers and sisters, the blessings of a forgiving spirit allows one to be able to truly relax. Seriously. To enjoy life. To be at peace. To also have the assurance of the forgiveness of sins along with Jesus' salvation. It also alleviates the holding of grudges along with the spreading of gossip, innuendo, as well as conflicts in the church, as well as the world. All that comes with forgiveness. So as we conclude this lesson that Jesus desires to leave with us, is that we, who by Christ's mercy have and continue to be forgiven, we also must be willing to take the initiative to forgive whomever has sinned and or offended us. And we must, within the power that God gives to us, bring about complete and total reconciliation. So my brothers and sisters, may all of us go forward together as forgiving brothers and sisters in Christ. <laughs> so in the name of Jesus, we pray. Okay, I better pray. We'll be here till <laughs> midnight. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Gracious Heavenly Father, how thankful we are that you are so compassionate. You're so full of love. And you're just waiting to pour out your blessings upon us. But you desire to hear us audibleize them, even though that's not a requirement. But you get pleasure hearing us 
come to you like a child comes to his daddy or her daddy. And so we're going to do that this morning, Father. You've heard your saints audibleize some requests of theirs that are heavy on their hearts. And so I want to bring those to your attention, as you already know. I want to lift up our brother Tony, uh, Alan Edwards, um, all the people uh, with uh, regard to our fires on the West Coast uh, and uh, in those proximities. Uh, we also want to lift up Chuck and Muriel Hale, for Rhonda, for Scott and Nikki, for Francis, and all our people, Father, who still uh, are not here with us. God, I pray that by your uh, sovereignty, that you would meet these respective journeys, not only meet them, but minister to them in very profound ways to provide the strength, the relief, the encouragement, and the peace that only you can provide so that they, so that they might be comforted and encouraged in their walk with you. And then, Father, I pray that that same spirit would draw people back to you in community worship and an intimate study of your word and walking with you by faith. Father, this morning, we thank you uh, th that you have um, taught us uh, by the way of your commandments and by your holy word. And we implore that you would please pour out your grace into our hearts and cause it to bear fruit in us that being ever mindful of your mercies and your laws, we might always be directed to your will and daily increase in love toward you and in one another. Enable us, Father, to resist all evil and then to live a godly and forgiving life. Help us to follow the example of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and to walk in his steps until we shall possess the kingdom that has been prepared for us in heaven. We ask all these through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.